All right, he who is of a proud heart stirs up strife, but he who trusts in the Lord will be prospered. We've had a, a lot to read, and Proverbs had a lot to say about pride. How does the proud heart stir up strife? This is, this is put forth as a truism. I mean, this is a truth, not an opinion. This is, he, he is a proud heart, stirs up strife. How does, how does one of a proud heart, and it says he, but this is another case in point where it's not exclusive to he's, he's or she's. How, how do they stir up strife? Okay. Okay, good, yeah, they're, the attitude here is, is that scorner or scoffer that uh, basically makes a, an ultimatum. It's, Marty put it, it's my, my way or the highway. And so that's a, a recipe for strife, um, whether it be in a marriage relationship or in, a, in a, just in a family relationship, in a church, in a business, in a nation, okay. How do we uh, say again? Not necessarily good decisions. How do we reconcile uh, the? I mean, the word of God is absolute, but it's not proud. Um, so, you know, somebody who's pr proud and is absolute in what they say, how, how do we reconcile the two? Why, why is the Word of God not proud? Why is God not proud in saying, you got to do it my way? Okay. Yeah, the the proud the one who's proud here, as we've seen in the bit greater context of Proverbs, is not somebody who is righteous or holy, or as Marty said, doesn't have a history of making wise decisions. Is usually self-serving, and the difference is God is all those things, and we can take all the attributes of God and understand that that He issues truth, absolute truth, but for our benefit and for the benefit of, of mankind altogether. Um, and so, to the, Ulu pointed out the, the contrast here in the second part, but he who trusts in the Lord will be prospered. And that is because God comes uh, to that truth with, uh, with, again, his attributes intact and his attributes intrinsic into, into issuing that truth. Uh, our final study last week on Tuesday nights, we looked at um, Christ being grace and full of grace and truth in John 1.14 and how we have the same, uh, we have the same uh, opportunity and really responsibility to be full of grace and truth in the way that we um, make decisions and the way that we present ourselves. And grace, being, when, you, when, you, when you act from a position of grace and truth, being filled with the Spirit of God, you're not going to, you're not going to act in pride. You, you can't, the two cannot happen at the same time. You can't be filled with the Spirit and walking in the Spirit and acting in pride. Uh, it, the Spirit is never going to lead there. So when a pastor or a, a ministry leader is, is, is clearly doing things out of a selfish motive or a wrong motive, and they say, but, but we're in the midst of revival, or I'm, I'm filled with the Spirit. It can't happen. 
they're filled with a spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit. It's a spirit of pride. Good. Yeah, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, Marty observed, is a good companion verse to this. What does it mean that the Lord, uh, he who trusts in the Lord, will be prospered? What does it mean to be prospered? Doggone it, Marty. You're always spoiling things. (laughs) If you didn't hear, Marty says it doesn't necessarily mean wealth. It means prospered. Okay. It, it would, it, it can mean blessed if that helps a little bit, but sometimes people even only look at blessings in terms of financial blessings. This, this has no financial context to it at all. This is about um, being blessed in your way or prospered in your way. And I think that's where Proverbs 3, um, 5 and 6 are, is a good companion for this because it, it tells us the same thing. Psalm 1 would be another good companion passage to this, uh, where he uses a much more poetic illustration. He will be like a tree planted by rivers of water that giveth forth fruit in its season. That's the kind of prospering he means. And so really when you, when you couple it with, or when you look at it in light of, of Psalm 1, the prospering is not necessarily of benefit to me. It's the opportunity to be prospered to benefit others. And, and what I mean by it, in, in Psalm 1, that, that tree that gives forth fruit in its season, what do we do when we walk in the Spirit? We bear the fruit of the Spirit, which is a benefit to us, but it, it's, it's really f- for the benefit of ministering to those around us. Enriched, good. Oh, so rich. So you think it's money, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Enriched, like, like bread, you know? <laughs> Bread always used to say enriched. What's that mean? It's got all those vitamins and minerals. All right, anyone else on 25? Well, 26 it goes with it. It states it in a little di- different way. It, it takes out pride, but it doesn't really because he says, he who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but whoever walks wisely will be delivered. Why is he who trusts in his own heart a fool? Because the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all else who can know it. In Jeremiah 17, 9. Um, is that true for just unbelievers or believers and unbelievers alike? What do you think? Everybody at Ulu says everybody. She says definitively. She's looking at me. Yeah, and I'm not trying to cast doubt on what Ulu said. She's exactly right. We, no, you, you're, you're right. I appreciate that because you're right. And we touched on that Sunday. I can't remember if it was Sunday morning or Sunday night that you know, we, all, we still struggle with sin. Um, that's what Romans 6 is about. It's what Romans 7 is, part, is in part about. Romans 8, uh, those three chapters, Paul talks about the reality of sin still in the believer's life and even in his own life. The things he wants to do, he didn't do, and the things he doesn't want to do, he does. And that, that could be true of all of us. That is true of all of us. And it's why uh, we're encouraged to be filled with the Spirit, not, not just, and to walk in the Spirit. Uh, because uh, that, that and the Word of God and prayer, the things we commonly talk about, are our best guards against yielding to uh, our flesh. Someone else?
Mm-hmm. Of God's word, yeah. Yeah, and, and this, this is a, a very relevant passage. I mean, it always is. I think we're just seeing the fruits of it maybe more in, uh, in bold print before us, or not even print anymore, but uh, just very boldly in front of us every day, that this is the result. We trust in our own heart, this is the result. Uh, it, 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 we're, going to, we're going to be ruled by uh, the thoughts and intents of our heart, we're going to be ruled by our emotions, and it's uh, chaos, and that's where we're at. And it's not new. I mean, this is, uh, the nation of Israel went through this. Uh, the split nation, both Israel and Judah went through it. Every, you know, the Roman Empire, we can go back through history. And uh, we'll see it just uh, play out in front of us again now. And why is that? Well, it's what Jim first said. Because the, uh, the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. And if we separate God out of the equation, or... Even if, as a lot of people are doing, well, let's drag God into it, or let's bring the Bible into it, but let's change what the Bible says or distort what God says. That's actually worse. Um, so we're seeing this, this proved out before us all the time in, in our culture, even within the Christian culture, and uh, hopefully not in our individual lives. But whoever walks wisely will be delivered. You know, this is true from salvation to just every issue, every problem we deal with. There's deliverance uh, that uh, God offers by some direct uh, commandment or some principle in Scripture uh, for the problems that we deal with. And, and it's not exclusive. I, I was told that the teenagers that, you know, we, we think because we're in a modern era that somehow this has gone out of date. The principles apply to everything. Nothing's changed but the setting. Nothing's changed but the props uh, and all the things that we have. The technology has changed, but the human heart has not changed. And so the principles of God's word uh, remain the same. Go ahead. Dustin. Did you have something, Tim? Tim, did you? Yeah, okay. So, yeah. Marty Stokes. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, again, the second part is is far-reaching because it, it applies to salvation. Whoever walks wisely will be delivered. Well, the wisdom is offered us. God sent His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. If we try to invent or find a different way of salvation, there's no deliverance. There's, there is, you know, Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no other name. There is no other name given under heaven by which men must be saved. Uh, and then to bring it into our life as believers, if we tinker with what God tells us, then 
and, and then we're, we have kind of the audacity to be disappointed that, uh, uh, that it didn't work. I had somebody tell me that once. They came and talked to me about uh, how to deal with a relationship. I said, well, you need to go talk to him. Oh, I tried that. It doesn't work. I said, well, did you, did you do it the way God's word says? He said, yeah, it doesn't work. I, I, I need something different. Uh, well, it may not have worked the way you want it to work, but the problem is we get a preconceived notion of what we want. We get the outcome in mind that we want. So let's take a relationship issue where somebody has harmed us or hurt us. We go and talk to them, and they blow us off. And we say, well, obviously what the Bible says doesn't work. Well, it works if you let it affect you because that's all that's in your control. All you can do is do what you've been called to do before the Lord. If you've gone and confronted the problem, as Matthew 18 says, if someone sins against you, you go to them, and if they listen, you've won your brother. He doesn't tell, I mean, he tells us what to do if they don't listen. You, can, you get to make a decision then. If they don't listen, um, he gives us the next step. But the next step is, well, it didn't work. It is either, okay, let it go. Um, and, and understand you, you tried to resolve it, you can leave it go there, and, and you can be released from the, any bitterness or any, you know, that hanging over your head. You can forgive them. And so, well, they don't deserve forgiveness. Neither did you, and neither did I. Uh, but God forgave us. Forgive us. <laughs> My English is shining tonight. Uh, God forgave us anyway. So we have the option to forgive them or take it to the next step. Take somebody else with you. But don't immediately leap to God's word doesn't work. God's word works every time we properly apply it. It just may not work in the way that we want it to work. Uh, and it's, it's using God's word rightly and using it in uh, conjunction with walking in the Holy Spirit to see how it's going to work. Uh, the, way, the way God wants it to work and have the effects he wants it to have in us. Our problem usually is we want it to work on them. And most of the time, God's working on us. And we don't, we don't want to be worked on because already, we've already arrived. You know? We're already there. <laughs> but we're not. I'm being facetious. Um, all right. Uh, 27, who, he who gives to the poor will, no, will not lack, but he who hides his eyes will have many curses. All right, so what's, this is pretty self-explanatory. How do we apply it today? Does it mean we're supposed to fix all the poverty and homelessness? And is that our responsibility? What's it, what's it telling us? I know we've had several of these verses before, but let's. But here we have another one, so we're going to deal with it. Hmm. Let's take the first part. He who gives to the poor will not lack. Will not lack what? Okay. It, it's, you know, you really could link this up with. Uh, the, the last two verses, uh, 26 will be delivered, 25 will be prospered. Um, and so it's, it's not talking about, oh, if I give a dollar, you know, like going to Ecclesiastes and cast your bread upon the water and it'll come back to you uh, over and over again. It, it's, not, it's not a get rich quick or, or a spiritual get rich uh, idea. Uh, the, what he's talking about not lacking is, can be satisfaction. Again, it can be blessings, prospering, enriched, to use Ryan's word back there. Um, all, all of those things that God equips us with, blesses us with when we help somebody who is in need. And it doesn't mean, it's, it's not necessarily saying every person you see you're supposed to help. I think we've talked about this before, maybe talked it to death, I don't know, but but if, what, what's the caveat, do you think? What is, what is the, what's the indicator of who we're supposed to help, Gene? James says, when you see a brother, so you can see the need of God. Okay. 
There are two, two there's, a, there's, an, there's a distinction that's not here, but it is. And really, this is talking about fellow believers. Now, how do we know that? The, the context again here in Proverbs is the nation of Israel. So he's talking about primarily brothers and sisters or the poor within the nation of Israel who we could contextually look at and say, that, well, he's talking in the terms of the assembly, right? The Old Testament assembly, which is the New Testament concept of the church. Ecclesia means assembly. Uh, so the first, the first thing he's talking about, and Gene's exactly right, James was talking to fellow Jews who had come to know Christ. He's talking to those 12 tribes that were scattered abroad. Uh, so they understood this idea that if you see a brother in need, only it's expanded in James, not, not just Jews, but fellow believers, then you have a responsibility to help them. Now, are there, is there small print or caveats? There are, because Paul says elsewhere, if you, if you see a brother that doesn't work, then he shouldn't need. I mean, he needs, he needs to get his priorities straight, and he needs to, you might need to deal with him about those things. Uh, you might even need to have the help contingent upon you, you need to go work or you need to get a job or you need to get your act straightened out. Uh, so this is kind of simplified for us. But when God simplifies these things for us, it's with the understanding that these are spirit-directed things he's talking about. So in other words, if I see somebody who has a need and the Holy Spirit meh, 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 you know, tells me that you need to lays upon my heart, you need to help that person. And I immediately begin to, yes, Lord, I know. Well, but I do need to fill up the tank on the way home, and we have to get groceries, and prices have gone up, and, you know, and on and on and on. And we talk ourselves out of what the Holy Spirit has laid on our heart. Um, then we certainly have a problem with the Lord then. So the first application is certainly with fellow believers, and there is a lot in Scripture about what we're supposed to do towards fellow believers. Uh, the, the rest of the world, it, it's, it is your option, and certainly if the Holy Spirit leads you to give to someone else, because it might open a door to share the gospel, but what God is not saying is what this, kind of the social gospel often puts forth, and that is it's the responsibility of Christians to go out and solve the, the poverty problem or solve the homelessness problem or, or, or things like that. It, it's not our, our priority, but it's not that we can't be involved in those things. It's not that you can't have a soup kitchen or a food pantry or a clothes pantry. You can do all those things. But the, the mandate in the Great Commission is, is much narrower and much greater. That is to go and preach the gospel. They need Christ. You want to use those things as an opportunity to preach Christ. That's what John's doing with, uh, with this medical mission. They go and preach Christ. And are they meeting physical needs? Absolutely. It's, a, it's an opportunity to open a door to preach Christ to people who need to hear about Christ. Uh, but oftentimes, the, the kind of the social-oriented gospel is just meet needs like Christ did. Christ didn't come just to meet physical needs. Christ came to preach the gospel and, and to, to preach salvation. So that's what, our, that's what our number one priority has to do. If meeting the needs of the poor gets in front of our, our uh, opportunities or our primacy to, to preach the gospel, then we've got it out of whack. But at the same time, if we say, well, we're just going to preach the gospel and we're not going to help anybody, then we can be at just as much out of whack as well. Uh, but he who hides his eyes will have many curses. And I think uh, Gene's right to go to, to the book of James because that's essentially what he's saying. You know, there is, uh, uh, there is judgment from God that um, he can visit upon his own children, discipline uh, on, on his own children if we, if we don't help each other, we don't meet each other's needs. Comments, questions? Yeah, that's a... 
that's a, that's a good observation. He says he who, who shuts his eyes or mine says hides his eyes will have uh, many curses. And there's something powerful about eye contact, isn't there? And if we see somebody in need, I mean, you know, when you see the people at the, the street corner and you're at the stoplight, you know, and they're over here and, you know, you, you we we have to be we have to be careful, especially uh, with fellow believers. If we hide our eyes from it and just uh, kind of have a self-imposed blindness to the needs that are all around us, then uh, that's a big statement. He'll have many curses. Good. Anyone else? Right. Widow indeed. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, and, and and again, that's the you know I hate to use the word fine print. It kind of sounds like God's hiding something. He's not. It's just it's another instance where we have to know the full counsel of God. Widows is a good is a good instance because widows need to be widows indeed, which means they're genuinely widows. Um, and you say, well, how does that work? Well, you know, that the, they meet the criteria of widows. And, and God lays out through the Apostle Paul um, the criteria. I mean, he even advises younger widows to go get married. Uh, and, and he gives the, without going into all the details, he gives the practical purposes for that. Uh, but widows indeed are widows who genuinely have nobody to care for them. Uh, he says specifically, if they have if they have believing family, then they need to take care of them. Now, it doesn't mean a church can't help or shouldn't help widows who have children or grandchildren who are believers, but the, the bulk of it should fall on the family, and, and they should be taking care of, of their mom or their grandma or, you know, whatever it should be if they're believers. Uh, and that's, a, that's an interesting caveat that Paul puts in there, you know, or that really God puts in there. If they have unbelieving family, then the church should be t helping to take care of them and should step in. And, um, and you know, God takes the issues of, of orphans and widows really seriously, uh, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, it's two groups that God uh, defines that he takes care of, but that his people, whether they be the Jews in the Old Testament or the church in the New Testament, are supposed to um, give attention to. He doesn't say that about widowers, but he does say widows. So you guys, me, us guys, we're on our own. Tim. Well, I mean, the family of God would be fellow believers. So any, anybody that's, that knows Christ, that is part of a family, is not just blood family, but is also, you know, of, of the, the family of God as well. So there, what I was saying a few minutes ago, Paul says if they have believing children and they have believing family, then they should take care of them. Um, and he's pretty harsh about if they don't. <laughs> uh, they're worse than, I think, is, is that where he says worse than an infidel? I, I believe that they, there's a pretty harsh statement if you're a believer and you don't take care of your, your parents or you don't take care of a widowed mother. Uh, you go back up to verse 24 that we looked at last time and it was two weeks ago because we had the derby last week. Uh, here in Proverbs 28, whoever robs his father or his mother and says it's no transgression, the same is companion to a destroyer. That's how serious God makes. Oh, the, guys, we are there. So father and mother, all right. Uh, but 
I don't know if that answers your question or not. Yeah, but it's, it's, you, you get double familyed if you have, you get double families if you are uh, a believer and your family's a believer as well because they're blood family you know, as well as uh, united in the blood of Christ. Uh, now, does that mean that if you're a believer and your widowed mother is an unbeliever, you don't have to take care of her? No, you have maybe a greater responsibility to take care of her. And we get into, I hear a lot of the yeah buts, yeah, but you don't know, you know, she's an unbeliever because she was an alcoholic her whole life, or she was an unbeliever because she was, she was this, or she was that, or she was abusive, or she, it's step up. I mean, that honor your parents, honor your father and your mother doesn't have an expiration date on it, and it doesn't have a caveat that only honor them if they're a believer. Uh, you have an opportunity like the uh, unbelieving, the, the believing wife in 1 Corinthians 7, who has the unbelieving husband, to uh, who knows? Paul says you may, you know, you may be a, a witness to to him. You have the same we have the same opportunity and responsibility with unbelieving parents uh, and to to take care of them. And do I? I don't pretend that it's easy. I I'm a step up and say, I don't have that experience. I had, you know, I had wonderful parents. Um, I, I, I don't have the experience of having it. My, my wife does. She has a, a mother that are, abandoned her and left her with the babysitter, and she didn't see her again for over 30 years. And so she has that experience. And she can speak to that better than I can, but it's been wonderful to see over the years how God has brought her through the process of forgiving her mom long before she was ever reunited with her mom uh, because that's, that's the freedom. I, I just saw this meme right before I came tonight that gets around Facebook and social media every so often. I don't know if you've seen it. You ever seen the one that has the snake curled around the saw? You ever seen that before? It says, okay, well, a snake, a snake was crawling along. He crawls over a saw, and it cut the snake's belly. And the snake got angry and wrapped himself around the saw to, to kill the saw. And he kept tightening and tightening and tightening. And, of course, the teeth of the saw cut into the snake until he, killed, he got killed. He killed himself, basically, by tightening against that saw and because he wasn't willing to let go of the anger and let go of the rage over uh, this inanimate object. And, we, you know, it's a very spiritual principle there that has to do with anger and has to do with bitterness. If we don't let go of it, then it's going to rule us. And it might bring about our demise, whether physical or emotional or our effectiveness as a believer or our ability to have other relationships in our life. We think that we can compartmentalize and be angry at mom and dad that raised us wrong or hurt our feelings or what have you and hold on to that bitterness and never let it go and think somehow that's not going to affect our relationship with our spouse or our relationship with our children or people at work. I, I'm here to tell you, it, it is invasive. It is cancerous. That's why God says in Hebrews, um, Hebrews 12, 12 or 13, um, you know, about that root of bitterness. Don't let a root of bitterness develop because by which many are um, affected. It's not affected. Say it was, thank you. Defiled. Many are defiled. It, it, you, you can't restrict it just to yourself. It's, it's, a, it's a bile. And um, again, I don't pretend it's easy. Uh, again, I watched my wife work through it for over 20 years, 25 years. Well, no, closer to 30 years. Um, and but once she, let, once she was able to let it go, what a, what a deliverance. I mean, it didn't take her 30 years. It was 30 years before you saw her mom again. But <sighs> Yeah, I know. I keep, I, I'm in my bedroom. I stand there and look at that mirror, and I think I'll look the same as I did. I realize it was my graduation picture. <laughs> Had to take it down. <laughs> All right, I'm just, anyone else? Well, I don't know how we got there from the poor, but. 
When the wicked arise, men hide themselves, but when they perish, the righteous increase. Well, this is a timely passage for sure. Um, so let's, let's define the, the pronoun in the second part. Who's the they? When they perish, the righteous increase. It's the wicked. Okay, so the wicked, when the wicked arise, men hide themselves. What's that mean? Well, I, I actually think he's, he's, there is at least an application there. I don't know if that's what God had in mind. We talked about something similar in Sunday school Sunday morning, and I, I think there's this tendency, you know, I don't think it, it's clear, that there's a tendency among Christians rather than to stand for righteousness to back off, and we don't want to be thought of as haters, we don't want to be thought of as judgmental, we don't want to be thought of as this or that. And, and the two can, can we, we can be both, and we should. That's what Christ was. Christ was forthright, and Christ was bold, but at the same time he was meek and lowly. And, and finding the, the I, don't, I don't know if it's really a balance, but just, just mastering the art of being able to stand on our convictions without being obnoxious or provocative, because I don't think Christ was ever intentionally provocative. He just set forth the truth. If the truth was provocative, it wasn't because he wanted to stir things up necessarily. It's just because it was the truth. And so I think Tim is right. Sometimes when the wicked arise, what do men do? They scatter. They hide themselves. They don't come out. Uh, they back off. They compromise. Uh, and that is... What word did you use? Cowardly? Or your son used? Cowardly? Yeah. It is cowardly because we're supposed to be bold as believers. Again, not obnoxious, but we're certainly supposed to be bold. Yeah. Go ahead, Dustin. Oh, no. Maybe. Well, as I said, I think you can make a couple different applications here. I don't think it's, because there are going to be different motivations and different reasons why men hide themselves when the wicked arise. Sometimes it's retribution. Uh, in the New Testament, well, we just, we just see the, uh, in John, we've just seen the apostles. They've been in hiding. They've been behind locked doors. Why? Well, it tells us explicitly, for fear of the Jews. So they were in fear initially before, Christ, before they had seen Christ. And were those, were those men wicked that arose? Absolutely. They just killed the Lord. 
And so were they cowardly? They were. I mean, they, you can make the case the women were bolder than the men were uh, there on Resurrection Sunday, on the, the first day of the week. Uh, the women went out there, but the men were back at the, at the place. And then when Mary comes and tells them, all, all of them didn't go. You only had two go. And, and so can, can I blame them? No. I've said, I said that from the poll, but I understand. I understand the way we are and the way we're built and the way our mind processes, especially when there's crisis. But uh, we don't have to cower and, uh, and hide ourselves just because the wicked seem to be the majority opinion. Uh, we still can and should and must, I think you, should, you can say, stand for what God's word says. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And Micah 6 eight doesn't get rescinded when the wicked arise. We're still supposed to uh, do what God has shown us, but to... Uh, walk justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly before our God, but to do, oh boy, I botched it. All right, somebody else had their hands up. He has shown the old man what is good and what the Lord requires of thee. But to do justly, there we go, and to love mercy and to walk humbly before our God. That doesn't change based on who's in power. Anyone? But, they, but when they perish, the righteous increase. Uh, and again, you know, it, it, there comes a point if we wait, if we just wait until the next election cycle or we wait until the, the wicked perish, um, it's, not, it's not advising us to do that, I don't think. I, I would probably tend to, to, certainly the application in our time right now is more what Isaac saw. Um, it's, it's just a statement of fact. This isn't giving us advice. It's saying this is what happens. This is what people do. It's not necessarily saying it's what we're supposed to do. It does. Yeah, two verses down, 29.2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. Say again. Okay. They groan. But how do with both of these, both twenty eight and, and and then twenty nine two, how do we justify that 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 it doesn't seem that's the case all because not everybody's happy when the righteous are in authority. So why, why does God have this in here? If, if not everybody's happy when the righteous are in authority and uh, not everybody's unhappy when the wicked rule. Why is that? Is God wrong here? <laughs> hmm. Or 
wicked. And, and Tim's right. And, and it's the same thing went on in the history of Israel to the point where, was it Isaiah? Isaiah or Jeremiah, or is it, they, the people have forgotten, God says the people have forgotten how to blush. That is a pretty powerful statement. They don't, they don't get, nothing shocks them anymore is basically what it's saying. They were, they were doing everything. You know, we think this is a unique time. It may be a unique time in the United States, and I don't know that it is. Again, the setting just changes. But it's not a unique time in world history. Certainly before the flood, uh, the people didn't blush. Every thought of their, every thought of their heart was, how does it say, every, every intent of their heart was evil all the time, I think one translation says. Um, it, later, in Sodom and Gomorrah, they didn't blush. Uh, they pounded on the door. Uh, and we go down through the history of the different nations and the nation of Israel itself. And we go down in, after, uh, after uh, the cross and the history of different nations that, w that we can look at, the history of the nation of Rome, Greece, Rome. Uh, and we can just go down the line. And they get to a point where they don't blush. And that's where we're at. And there's only, there's only two uh, alternatives. Either repent or uh, get ready for judgment. Because whether it's the final judgment or whether it's just another in a long line of judgments that God's visited on nations because of this very principle, um, judgment will come. And we're already seeing it. I mean, that's, that's what's astounding is that we, we kind of go through the, the days and Christians go through the days and un, you know, non-Christians go through the days. Of, well, it's, it's, just, it's just bad economic indicators or it's bad geopolitical situation or it's just bad climate or it's bad this or bad that. No, it's wickedness. You know, you, again, you, you call it what it is and what do people do? They get angry. Uh, and uh, more and more cr Christians, pastors, pe preachers from the pulpit don't want to call it what it is. That's what it is. The problem is always the same. It's us. You know, what's, was that Pogo? The comic strip Pogo is supposedly it came up with that line, we have seen the enemy and it is us. Uh, that's a very spiritual principle. Uh, the enemy is us. It's, you know, John says it's not, it, it's not... Uh, No, James. James says it's not, it's not uh, the devil that makes us do it. He doesn't say that, but he says it's our lust. It's, it's our, you know, it comes out, our sin comes from our lust. We're tempted when we're drawn away and enticed by our own lusts. And sin, when it gives forth, uh, is matured, it gives forth. Temptation, when it's matured, gives, it leads to sin. And sin, when it is matured, brings forth death. Boy, Lowell, did you slip me one of those pills in my drink? It's, it's us. And that's the problem here. And that's the problem in our, in our, in our country right now. It's, uh, we're going to divorce ourselves from God and from the Word of God and from any, uh, anything that is attached to the Word of God, God's design for marriage, God's, even God's design for gender. I mean, who ever thought we'd get to this point? Well, I, I understand it from a, you know, from a, good American standpoint, I would never think so, but from a spiritual standpoint, it makes sense. Uh, because once things begin to deteriorate, they deteriorate pretty doggone fast. Doesn't mean there's not hope. Again, one of the alternatives is repentance. And God could wipe away the wicked, and uh, hopefully the righteous will increase, just like this verse says. But... Uh, but I think that it doesn't mean that the righteous stay in hiding and wait for God to wipe out the wicked. It means you have to take a stand. You have to do what we're called to do and be faithful in, uh, in our responsibilities as believers. All right, we'll start 29 next week.
This is man's all. It's a big statement at the end of Ecclesiastes. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. That's, that's it. At a big task, granted, but that's it. And if we're going to say, well, I'm going to do that. I'm going to fear God and I'll keep, well, I'll keep these commandments. But, not, but, but those are out of date or those are, are not, well, they're not relevant for us today. Well, I understand the law is not relevant for us today, but the commandments of Christ are always relevant. And uh, if we start picking and choosing, then we're not fearing God. Because if we're genuinely going to fear, revere God for who he is, then we're going to keep his whole, we're going to keep his whole counsel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity again to open your word in freedom. And Father, we know that that's not something we're guaranteed. Uh, Father, help us to redeem the time because we know that the days are evil and that we have a great responsibility, a great opportunity to be witnesses to uh, to our, our families, to our, our co-workers, to our neighborhoods, our communities. Father, help us to be diligent to, to do that. And uh, Father, we pray that uh, you'd give us boldness in our witness and uh, that we would firmly stand on your word. I pray that you walk with each one as they, as they leave this place, that uh, you would lead them safely home tonight and bring us back again 